Hello, welcome to another uh, installment of A Forkful at uh, a Time. I'm, we're entering, um, starting tomorrow, um, Passion Week, um, leading up to the brutalization, uh, the death, the burial, uh, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And um, tomorrow being Palm Sunday, um, what, what a wonderful time to uh, come again into studio and uh, begin to revisit uh, the things that uh, truly connect us uh, with the Lord our God. <clears throat> and so I'd like to uh, present a message today, uh, hopefully one that uh, you find uh, enlightening but also uh, inspirational. Uh, we'd like to talk today on the subject of Behold, the King of Zion comes. Behold, uh, the King of Zion comes. And that's a message that um, is um, important uh, to us <clears throat> because we believe that Jesus Christ uh, is our, our Lord and King. We believe that uh, he is um, uh, the creator who came into this world uh, to... Uh, show mankind God's great love and God's great compassion uh, for them. And so this scripture that we're looking at today is in uh, John <clears throat> chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. And let's read this scripture from the New King James Version Bible. The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. <clears throat> then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. And so, behold, the king of Zion comes. And when we look at this uh, particular event, we find that it is an event that was recorded uh, by all of the gospel writers. Um, Matthew in chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Luke 19, 29 through 44. And then uh, this passage uh, that we're looking at today from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. And the important thing to remember about uh, all of this um, being recorded by the gospel writers, that it was all of the gospel writers, and all of those ought to be read if you really want to um, get clarity, uh, get further insight into what occurred uh, in this event. It's important to us. It's significant. When God records something by his Holy Spirit in four different places, it tells us as believers that uh, is something that we ought to pay attention to, amen? It's something that we ought to uh, look at and, and try to get our arms around what was going on at that time frame. And so what we find is that there's four factors that um, are surrounding Jesus' entry into Jerusalem at this important moment in time. Uh, four factors, they're not the only factors, but these are four factors that really um, give us a picture, Amen. And so those four factors include uh, the Passover pilgrims, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, the raising of Lazarus from the dead that occurred in John chapter 11, verses 17 through 45, the religious leaders' rejection of Jesus um, as their king, as their uh, Messiah, and the fact that his hour uh, has now come. And we'll talk about uh, his hour has now come. But the important thing about all of this, the thing that hangs over all of this, uh, the thing that unifies and places some context was that um, the Jews had an expectation of Messiah. They had an expectation 
of this person, this warrior, this king, this leader, this deliverer that was going to come and deliver Israel from uh, its oppressors. Amen. And so um, we'll look at these uh, four factors, understanding that um, th these four things, uh, you, you can't put them in a particular chronology or sequencing b because they are interrelated, uh, interdependencies uh, lie between these four factors, uh, the fact that they were expecting this Messiah. Uh, so we, we're not uh, speaking whether chronologically or serially. We're not trying to prioritize or place one over the other. If anything, uh, they're all important. They all say something about Jesus Christ. Amen. And so the four things uh, we'll look at. Um, so let's talk about, first of all, the pilgrims of the Passover. The crowd that greeted Jesus uh, were not uh, residents of Jerusalem, but were Jewish pilgrims who had come there in their annual pilgrimage. Recall Passover is an annual fest festival. Passover is an annual event uh, to the Jewish community. And so Thousands of pilgrims had come from um, all over um, that uh, part of the world. Um, they are called the Jews of the Diaspora. They were spread. They were scattered. Israel um, was uh, dominated by various empires that scattered them. Recall uh, the Assyrians carried away uh, Israelites. The Babylonians carried away um, Israelites. The Egyptians carried away um, and so um, these pilgrims, though, um, made a return annually. They, they found their way. They put it in their budgeting. They planned uh, to come back to this great festival, this great reminder of what God had done in, uh, recall, delivering Israel from uh, the hands of uh, the Egyptians. Uh, these Passover pilgrims were aware that um, Jesus Christ had raised Lazarus from the dead. Uh, that's recorded in John chapter 11. And, and so these pilgrims um, had come to believe that Jesus was to be the expected Messiah. And in fact, they hailed him as the king of Israel. They were uh, citing a passage found in uh, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And so the pilgrims of the Passover were there. We have a crowd then that is filled with this um, expectation of, of, of deliverance. They were always looking for the Lord to deliver Israel. Um, and the Passover event served to remind them that um, God had done this miraculous thing in their past, and they were still expecting, and they were looking for this Messiah to come and uh, deliver them from the hands of the oppressors. Amen. Look first at, uh, secondly, at the raising of Lazarus from the dead. That's recorded in John chapter 11, verses 14 through 44. There, Jesus, the Son of God, he exercised an absolute, uh, irrepressible, and undeniable power over death. Um, when you read um, the, the John uh, chapter 11, there is no doubt in Jesus' mind that Lazarus was dead. And he told his followers that I'm going back to uh, Bethany. I'm going to visit uh, my friend, uh, his family, uh, because he's sleeping but uh, he's going to be awakened. And they didn't understand that. And so he had to clarify that no, Lazarus is dead, and I'm going back uh, to raise him from the dead. And so um, because there were mourners there with um, Mary and Martha, uh, they were there to uh, see uh, and uh, to witness uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Um, and then uh, the word went out when Lazarus was, Lazarus was raised from the dead. And so uh, the crowd grew. It was this excitement that this event had occurred. Amen. And so uh, this great feat, though, that Jesus performed in raising Lazarus from the dead, uh, it was a mighty thing. But the most important thing is that um, he will give um, eternal life. Uh, to uh, to those who receive him, those who believe that he was raised from the dead, um, they become children of God and they receive eternal life 
uh, because they believed the message about him. Amen? And so the raising of Lazarus from the dead um, was an element. Uh, the word spread, and the word spread that the one who raised Lazarus from the dead was coming to town. And so the excitement builds because of, of that event, this spectacular event. You know, um, there were many who came purporting to be the Messiah, but none of them ever um, performed any miracle like raising from a man from the dead. And because it was witnessed, uh, recall uh, his his sister said, um, "Lord, uh, he, he's been in the grave for three for four days now. Uh, he probably smells. He probably stinks." Nevertheless, Jesus said. Uh, uh, open that uh, tomb up, and uh, he called him out. Amen. Uh, the other element that is involved here is uh, the religious leaders' rejection of Jesus Christ uh, from the onset of his public ministry. From the first time he appeared on the scene, Jesus had been rejected by uh, the religious uh, leaders of Israel. Um, I love the fact, and I like where John summarizes their rejection of him. Uh, John says in chapter 1, verse 11, uh, he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. You read it in the King James, he came unto his own, and his own um, received him not. But amazingly, and by the will of God, it had been prophesied, uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, chapter 53, verse 1, uh, talking about Messiah, talking about God's mighty salvation, says uh, the question, or asked the question, uh, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? In other words, uh, the prophet is posing this uh, prophetic question. Are people going to believe, will people believe um, that uh, God is performing deliverance. Will people believe what we say about what God is doing? And so the chief priest, though, not only disbelieved and rejected Jesus Christ, but when we look in John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, they also decided that Lazarus must die. A man who had been raised from the dead, they now say, uh, you know what? Uh, Lazarus needs to die too. So you have the religious leaders willing to murder two men in order to retain or maintain their control, their position of status um, over the Israelites. And so they determined that Lazarus, uh, along with Jesus, uh, had, had to die. Imagine that. Here's Lazarus um, being raised from the dead by Jesus Christ. <laughs> And, and now the religious leaders are deciding that, no, he must die again. That's the way it is when you um, set your heart um, uh, against um, someone that vehemently, when your, your, your mind is so opposed uh, to um, that which God is doing, uh, that kind of hatred drives illogical and irrational decisions when you think about it, amen? It's illogical and irrational to want to kill a man who has already been dead. Then Jesus' hour has now come. Uh, we find multiple mentions of this um, point in time, this hour. Um, in John chapter 7, verse 30, it says that they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Amen. I found in Mark chapter 14, verse 35, uh, there Jesus is praying. It says he went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. Amen. This metaphor of the hour. It denotes God's appointed time when Jesus would suffer and die. Our, uh, God in heaven had determined that the sacrificial lamb would come and die on behalf of mankind. So it was an appointed time. Uh, the Paul, um, the apostle records in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And so what Paul is saying there is at the right moment in time, at the right moment in history, God's 
appointed one would come to die for the sins of the world. So this uh, Passion Week, this event of Jesus riding into Jerusalem, um, it, it is the, the trigger point, it's the uh, catalyst, it's the moment in time when um, God has decided now the sacrificial lamb must be uh, sacrificed. He must be killed uh, to atone for the sins of man. Amen? And so uh, when I uh, look at this then, we see that all of these things are tied to God's um, Israel's expectation of Messiah. You see, Israel had groaned over its history under various oppressors while hungering nationally for the promised appearance of God's anointed one. Uh, in the Hebrew, the word is Masa, uh, the uh, or Mesa. The the concept of Messiah. Uh, it grew out of many prophetic declarations like Deuteronomy uh, 9.15, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, um, uh, Isaiah 11, uh, 1 through 16, chapter 40, um, verses 1 through 11, uh, Jeremiah, uh, on down the line, you find these mentions of this anointed one that God would uh, send, Amen. Israel had this expectation that came out of prophetic declarations that God was going to send uh, this son of David, uh, this one who was of the, um, um, the race of David or the downstream of David or the progeny of David. God was going to send him. And the Passover season, as I said earlier, the Passover moment reminded them of a previous great deliverance that uh, God had um, delivered Israel with a mighty and outstretched hands from the hands of the Egyptian. Jesus' raising of Lazarus from the dead spoke of miraculous power. So here's what we've got now. You've got uh, the Passover moment occurring, the Passover uh, festival uh, in which Israel is looking for uh, this deliverance again, this um, uh, being set free from the oppressors again. You have Jesus' raising of Lazarus from the dead that spoke of God's miraculous power. You have Jesus now determining that I'm going to go into uh, Jerusalem. I'm going to go into town. Amen? And the people heard about that. The people knew he was coming uh, knowing that religious leaders uh, sought to kill him. Amen? And so their minds immediately seized upon the concept, uh, the belief that this had to be uh, Messiah's triumphal entry uh, that is mentioned in the uh, book of Jeremiah, uh, I'm sorry, Zechariah. This had to be his triumphal entry. And so he's coming into town, and there he is, riding on um, this ass's coat. There he is with uh, the palm leaves being uh, strewn out before him, um, people hailing him. Um, he rode, though, uh, upon an ass's coat, which did not um, look very impressive. Um, you would have thought that uh, uh, a king, um, uh, this Messiah, would come riding in on a white horse. They, they were drawing on uh, this idea um, that they experienced it um, in their heritage. I, I found that um, the um, in uh, this um, the historical book of uh, the Maccabee is not one of those books that's included in our Bible, but uh, in uh, the Jewish historical record called the Maccabee, you find at least two instances of um, someone uh, being welcomed in this fashion I found in uh, 1st Maccabee uh, 1351 it says uh, when Simon the Maccabee entered Jerusalem in triumph it is recorded that he entered with thanksgiving and branches of palm leaves and with harps and cymbals and with viols and hymns and songs because there was destroyed a great enemy out of Israel that was one occasion when uh, the, the uh, Maccabee had uh, destroyed, uh, I believe it was uh, some, some Grecians or uh, some Herodians. And then we found um, uh, in Second Maccabee chapter 
10, verse 7, it says, When his brother Judas the Maccabee defeated the Syrians, it is said that people carried branches and fair bows, bows of trees, uh, and palms also, and sang psalms. Amen? And so um, they were drawing on something that had uh, occurred in their history. But Jesus didn't ride in in a triumphal entry like uh, what is recorded in the Maccabee. Uh, there was nothing kingly about his entrance. It says, uh, when you read through scripture, that uh, instances where he talked from a borrowed boat. Recall he ate the Passover uh, in a borrowed room. He was buried in a borrowed grave. And here he rode in on a borrowed ass. And so uh, he was not going to be exalted uh, to uh, the Davidic throne. He was not going to be placed on the throne of David, but he would be lifted up on Calvary's cross. And even his closest followers uh, misunderstood uh, this entry into Jerusalem. They didn't understand that he was going to die for the sins of the world. They just hadn't gotten it um, throughout his teaching. They hadn't got this. Amen. John records in chapter 15, verse 26, though, But when the Comforter is come, I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. In other words, the Holy Spirit, downline or downstream of these events, the Holy Spirit would show the Israelites, show the world the real meaning of this first advent of Jesus Christ and why he did what he did. Amen? So what's the application of all of this? What, what is the application of what meaning can we draw out of this? Uh, what we want to draw out of it is that Jesus Christ still desires to ride, if you will, into the lives of men, women, boys, and girls. Uh, the same king of Zion who uh, rode in on, on that particular day he desires to be the Lord of all hearts because he is alive and he's still presenting himself to mankind. Jesus is still arriving to die for the sins of the world, for your sins and for my sins. He's still meek and humble and he's still pleading for us, to you, to receive him unto salvation. And so our lesson is titled, Behold, the King of Zion Comes. Uh, as, I, as I said at the onset of this uh, video, uh, we're entering into Passion Week. And, and what a wonderful time to stop and, and recall what was going on then. We, we place, um, as human beings, uh, expectations on Jesus Christ. They were looking for something that uh, God was not going to give them at that moment. What we ought to look for, though, is, God, what is it you are going to do? Let us tap into and let us understand what it is that you intend to do, that you're going to do right now, and let us not um, box you in or try to pigeonhole you with our expectations. We can't do that. We have to let him come into our lives and do the thing that he's purposed to do. Do the thing that he's determined to do. And so here, Jesus Christ determined to go into Jerusalem. He determined uh, to die for my sins and for your sins. And we praise God for that. We thank him for that. And so we title this lesson, Behold, the King of Zion Comes. And we now live for and look for, have an expectation of a day or a moment in time that is prophesied that he's going to come again. It's not for us to say when that event is going to occur. It's not for us to say how that event is going to look. God has declared it. He has said that he will send the son to uh, come again, this second advent uh, that um, Christians now expect, but it's not for us uh, to set the time or the date. Uh, recall when Jesus was preparing to uh, return to glory, uh, his followers asked him, Lord, will you at this time 
uh, restore the kingdom to Israel. Well, you at this time, you've been raised from the dead. You've been resurrected. We've seen you in your post-resurrection ministry. Will you now uh, restore uh, Israel uh, to its position of power and influence? And his answer was, it's not for you to know uh, the things that the Father has determined. And so it's not for us to know. It's for us to serve him, be loyal to him, be faithful to him until he comes again. And should we close our eyes in death before he comes again, we will die in hope and expectation of seeing him in eternal glory. Amen. So we thank God for you. We thank God for this opportunity to once again uh, come into uh, the studio. We pray that God bless you. May the Lord's face ever continue to shine upon you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, until we meet again, Mike out. <laughs>